So I'm actually going to answer this in the case of specifically education, right? And I think that I wanted to look at the idea of giving, I mean, with the scale of education, I think that we have a lot of folks who think it's really just an only one size fits all. And that's like the only way to do it. And I think for a long time, that was true. But I think now with the case of, you know, adding in tools with artificial intelligence, adding in ways for us to gather data about, you know, where people are struggling, the data points that you can get from things like your learning management system, um, things about, you know, where people are having, you know, particular trouble points and like looking at things like, you know, sort of test scores and things like that. You can gather a really good picture of how to actually properly help somebody. And I think that there is a something to be said about giving people more of an active role in how they learn, you know, subject material in such a way where um, I would almost conjecture to say that you could actually personalize every learning experience. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Expert. I'm your host, Devin Miller, the serial entrepreneur that's grown several startups into seven and eight figure businesses, as well as a founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat. We're always here to help. Now, today we've got another great guest on the podcast, Mike Liu. And uh, Mike, uh, we're going to be talking about a few different things, including uh, how to better utilize uh, data um, to create a, a better organization and how to optimize uh, yourself using that data and uh, finding and uh, resolving bottlenecks, um, how the data can be used uh, where or to show uh, where you should utilize other people and also how to use the uh, data to become a better uh, a better uh, leader. And so as you can tell, data is going to be a good conversation. So with that much as an introduction, welcome on the podcast, Mike. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Devin. Very much appreciative for being able to come back here again. Uh, for those of you who did not catch the uh, last episode that I was on, I am Mike Liu, the CEO and uh, founder of FreeFuse. Um, and we're a company that allows you to create uh, basically viewing journeys for any type of audience based on their decisions, um, kind of like that 40,000 foot view. And uh, data plays a lot of roles into how people can observe the behavior of, of other folks. And most importantly, it helps drive the analytics that are so important about how you can actually build a better business and build a better experience for all. So, so excited to be back here again. Awesome. And uh, you stole a bit of my thunder, which is uh, certainly uh, good for you. Um, and uh, with that, you know, so as you guys may have caught, Mike was on the uh, sister podcast of this one, The Inventive Journey. So definitely encourage you to go check out his episode there uh, so you can hear about his full journey. Uh, but for today's discussion, you know, as I mentioned, there's a, a lot of things that you can do with data now. One of the things I think is sometimes difficult with data is you can gather a lot of data or, you know, you may have those systems in place, but now what do you do with that data? In other words, if all you're doing is collecting the data, you don't do anything with it, it doesn't do you a lot of good and it just is a lot of time, money, expense and effort. But if you use it right, um, then it can provide a lot of insights and a lot of direction to things. So one of the things that we uh, talked about a little bit is, you know, in maybe in, in more general is utilizing data in order to create a better organization and to improve your organization. So kind of walk us through a little bit of so, or how you might go about what data you should collect and how you might go about using that data in order to, um, uh, to improve your organization. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of ways to look at it. First of all, there's actually a significant difference uh, between data and analytics itself. Right. Um, and it was something I learned, you know, a little while back about, uh, you know, what is the difference between just the information that you're collecting and what are the actual pertinent insights that you can gather about the world around you, right? And well, a lot of people are really focused on what can you collect and, you know, what what does that mean, right? I think uh, putting things in context is incredibly important. Um, and it comes from my time as a, an engineer, you know, within the vocation of engineering, that you need to be able to not just take data points and say, you know, hey, this is the data. You need to be able to actually go and put a story around it, right? And you need to actually provide context and a greater understanding of what's going on. And that'll help you in a variety of ways. So in terms of actually your organization, you might pick up data points about, you know, something as simple as 
uh, how often are people actually reading through a lot of my messages? Are people actually opening my emails internally even, right? There's actually ways to understand that. Or you can get something as, you know, kind of granular as understanding what is the lifetime that someone actually spends within my organization, right? Is are, are people actually spending maybe six months employed by me? Is there something about the six month time period that on average people are leaving? You know, are there, how long is the onboarding process? How long is the training process? And when you look at those things and you see that there are averages that you can look at, you also want to take a look at medians, right? Because you might actually have outliers and you want to understand why is it that someone only spends a month, you know, maybe in the organization, whereas someone has spent two years, right? And that's kind of maybe an outlier for yourself as well. So when you look at the story and you look at everything in the pieces of context, it gives you more of a picture and less of a point, right? And something that you can really expound upon to build a much stronger, more efficient organization over time. No, I think that makes that makes perfect sense. Now, one or one kind of question I'm circle back just a little bit. The intro is, you know, I can, you know, a lot of times if you have a, you know, CRM in place, customer relationship management system manager, mm -hmm. I always forget the acronym, but the CRM in place, you know, you can uh, certainly gather that data. But, you know, the question is, is how do you use that data? And you start to hit on it. But I think the question is, is you usually, you know, my experience in working with other businesses as well as our own is you get gung ho about data, you'll look at it for a week or two, or if you're really diligent, maybe a month, then you get busy and bored out doing other things and you never really continue to utilize it, not because it's not valuable, but just because you have, you know, sometimes more pressing concerns or other things that you, you know, that are draw your attention away. And so any initial kind of thoughts as to how you might go about consistently using is that data is it hiring someone like you or is it hiring someone internally or is it putting it on your calendar or is it making it more manageable or bite size or i don't know i'm just making up a whole bunch of <laughs> things uh, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you just that you know kind of how do you consist or how do you reinforce util utilizing that data so that you can continue to um you know improve the organization yeah that's a great question so i'm going to answer it in a couple kind of parts. First of all, when you're the most excited about something is always when it's like the first time you use something, you're like, oh man, look at all the stuff I can use. <laughs> right. And you want to like set up everything. Um, I believe that there's a certain specific half-life of like your excitement against like using a product, right. No matter what, like even using something as HubSpot, right. Like they try to make it as apparent as possible to tell you things like open rates to tell you things like, okay, you know, this is how many people have actually made it through the process. And they try to make it really nice and visual and granular, but no matter how excited you are about certain aspects of data, unless you're like a data scientist or unless you're somebody who really geeks out about that stuff, your half-life of actual attention and energy about whether you're excited about this is going to be the highest near the beginning, and it'll slowly taper off over time. So what I've found is a really good system is when you have your most excited times, try and piecemeal that data into the most effective uh, largest leverage items that you can go and report to yourself every week, right? Set that up in the beginning. You want to know why? Because down the road, when you're like, oh, I need to do that, you know, you're, you're probably not going to. So I would imagine if you're excited about a system right now, uh, you're going to want to try and feed in, you know, as many data points as you can into something that's a dashboard. Um, I want to say that there's uh, a few items you can use. Uh, I believe there's something called like Gecko Board or, you know, similar services that, can actually <clears throat> like come in and actually add data from a bunch of different integratable systems, right? And so if you can get a snapshot of, okay, what is the what is the amount of deals that are getting closed every month against like, you know, what our pipeline is, right? What is the amount of, you know, what is the amount of leads that are, you know, getting contacted and going into the top of our funnel, right? And like looking at all of those things. You know, the reality of it is with so much information and, and items out there, uh, getting snapshots is is a way to maintain your sanity, right? Like you don't have to like comb through insane amounts of data just trying to find all the good nuggets, right? And so if you can set up efficient systems like right from the get-go when you're like, I am ecstatic, ecstatic about using this product. I am stoked. This is great. Let me set all this up. You understand that that time is like where you need to do that because your energy is going to be highest. And I'll give an example. So. 
um, when I was setting up like a bunch of conversational nurtures, right? This isn't necessarily data, but this is kind of expounding the point of the product, uh, you know, setting things up beforehand. That stuff is tedious, right? Like even doing that, like setting up every single conversational string actually became, you know, really mentally taxing because you have to think about every situation and scenario. And of course, I set up the data recording about like how, you know, how many people make it through this part of the branch and what can it report out to me? So that was when I was the most excited about HubSpot, right? And now I'm kind of like, all right, cool, HubSpot's great. It's telling me stuff. But like, I don't think at this point now I could go back and like build out that system. Even tweaking it hurts, right? So, you know, I just think that taking advantage of that energy and excitement and attention you have in the very beginning, do that and you will feel so much better, you know, down the road. Um, and it'll obviously give you some returns on what it is your efforts are actually doing. Right. Um, and then now, I would say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in, just ask the follow-up question, which is now yes. let's say you're burned out with data or taking the opposite. Cause I think yeah. you're right. And you know, the best time is, is the same with anything when you're setting it up and you know, you're excited about it. You will, it's a new toy. It's a new something that you are excited about and it improve is a much different than, Oh, I'm just so worn out or yeah, I tried that before and we started to use it and then I got tired of it or it was too burdensome or too cumbersome or I got lost or that. So any, any thoughts on re-engaging if you got kind of got to that point where you were burned out or otherwise don't want to go back to it to kind of reignite that flame. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that in, in any tool that you use, anything that you're going to utilize, you obviously want to see some level of like return on investment or, you know, one of my favorite new things that I've been, you know, sort of conceptualizing my head, which is return on risk, right? And so, you know, whenever you're putting in any time and effort, you want to feel like that actually has some, you know, movable measure of the needle, you know, to what is actually your business, right? I think that as you become sort of burnt out using specific tools, I think it's really, really important to get those really nice snapshot dashboards. And I think that there's a lot of tools that actually allow you to create a set of widgets. I'll give you an example. So Pendo, for example, um, it's a tool kind of similar to Google Analytics, you know, high level, right? Like you can actually track clicks, track how people go through your site. You can essentially, um, you can essentially tag like individual buttons on your website and things like that. And you can tag individual pages to see what the conversion rate is. Um, so when you use a tool like that, it's actually really easy, but regardless of how easy and kind of fun it was and novel in the beginning, no matter what, like that kind of gets taxing over time. But what it does allow you to do in the dashboard section is it allows you to sort of move widgets around um, and actually go ahead and put the like the most pertinent data you're trying to get all the time, right? Mm. And so uh, when you're getting to that point of like burnout, because at, at a certain sense, no matter how excited you are about this, there's like looking at numbers for a certain period of time will, will make your brain explode. Right. And so if you want to avoid that, I would recommend that you organize the system in the highest leverage ROI statistics that you have. Right. If you're looking at how many people are my monthly active users, right, maybe a just quick snapshot, our weekly active users, if you're looking at it every week you know, you need to go ahead and look at that, right? How many website visits am I getting? How many people are actually clicking on my call to action buttons, right? You know, are, are there ways for you to make that really plain and clear every time you log in, right? Because at the end of the day, every page that you click on, every part of the new experience that you go through, or every part of the experience you go through that you have to dig even deeper, you have to think there's like a certain, um, there's a certain amount of mental energy you expend having to search for things, right? There's a certain, you know, kind of mental energy you're, you're burning every time. And no matter even if you have it down to a science for seven or eight pages in that you're going to go and click through every time, that's a process that wears on you over time, right? It's kind of like death by a thousand cuts or something like that, right? So if you can get everything laid out for you up front to where you don't feel overwhelmed, you don't think that, you know, you, you have so much information here that it makes your brain explode, then you're going to be in a really good spot to actually having more actionable insights. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you're somebody who obviously has these resources, the other option is to, of course, grab, you know, somebody who's a virtual assistant 
or somebody who can actually go and basically clean all the data and put it in a, you know, sort of reportable spreadsheet, like a Google Sheets or something like that. And then you can actually get a snapshot yourself if you're not comfortable with, you know, sort of putting together a dashboard with so many integratable pieces. So it's a number of ways to do it. And, you know, it's kind of just how you prefer to work with folks that'll really matter. No, and I think that's a, a lot of uh, great piece of advice and takeaways. And one of the ones you hit on, I think that it has to be something that's actionable. In other words, if all it is, is, you know, um, data that is interesting, or maybe you find, you know, cool, or, you know, is, is kind of in, or fun to see, but doesn't really help you understand how to improve your business or what the return on it is or anything else. I don't think no matter, even if you really love data, you're still not going to look at it after a little while after you lose that excitement. But if you can get that kind of that vision and in place as to what are the ways that they can improve your business, how you can le leverage and utilize it, I think that that uh, has a, a lot more of the staying power. Now, one of the things that you'd hit on, which I think, you know, is an interesting aspect, and when we chatted a little bit before is, you know, how to make yourself a better leader. And you started to touch on some of those maybe with open rates with emails or some of the other things as to how, how much of, uh, of the things that you're doing as a leader do people pay attention to or otherwise resonate with them. But give us a bit or embellish that a bit, give us a better idea of what are kind of some of the data points or data or sources of data or information you should be looking at as a leader that can help you to improve. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, like any good scientist, I think that there is a certain like a level of two types of data that you're going to receive, right? A lot of people always look at quantitative data, like stuff that you're going to say, you know, open rates, you know, the percentage of people, um, you know, the percentage of people who actually respond to your messages, you know, things like engagement, right? Like how many people are like actually actively involved in some of the initiatives that I'm talking about, right? That's all quantitative data. Right. But um, I, I feel like there's a, a certain level of being a good scientist where you need to have qualitative data. Right. The scientific method, you know, folks who know it also might know it as the lean startup method if you you know didn't really spend a lot of time in that realm. And so I think that the the process of understanding the way that people uh, sort of perceive you can be looked at in a bunch of different prisms. Right. And I like to really engage in a couple qualitative points and quantitative points. For example, um, I have folks who obviously report to me and I have folks who report to the folks who report to me, right? Um, one of the really nice things that I've done sort of like in this early stage is really institute something like the skip level, right? It's a way for me to gather qualitative data about the health of the organization, right? Are the things that I'm telling the folks who are reporting to me, are they actually getting trickled down to the folks that are actually getting, you know, underneath those people, right? And when you look at that, you get you get a better sense and an understanding of what is actually being told or what is actually the message being conveyed to another person. What's the transferability of that message? Because, uh, you know, when you when you think about communicating with people especially, you know, folks in leadership positions, the first thing you think about is that, wow, everything I said was super clear, right? Everything I said was, you know, I I, I felt like I communicated everything very well. I, I might have had PowerPoint slides, high level framework for how to, you know, engage people. Then you come to find out that a lot of the initiatives that you asked about just weren't getting done, right? And you wonder why, right? Because you were you were thinking, hey, this is going to be a really good move, move, or mover for our ROIs, we're going to really see some real, you know, dividends here as we're moving forward. And then you find out no one had been working on that stuff. All right. And, you know, there's obviously a certain level of communicating priorities, which I've found that, you know, pe some people, including myself, you know, sometimes can, you know, maybe miscommunicate uh, something. And it turns out that someone thought something else was priority over another thing. Right. That's why it's really, really important to over communicate. But the real good measure is to actually talk to somebody who is actually getting some of those frontline orders or sort of like frontline, you know, kind of instructions about how they need to conduct themselves and really see if they match against like what your initiatives and, you know, edicts were for the, uh, you know, for the organization, right? And, you know, that's one major element. Um, another major element of qualitative that I like to do, of course, is I always like to kind of figure out, is there a way for me to kind of talk with people and see like, what are some of the things that I specifically can do better, right? And, you know, one of the things I like to utilize, of course, so that I don't get information overload trying to read a transcript on Fireflies or one of the other apps 
is of course to use some of the meeting summaries to see some of the high level items. And uh, if I actually, it's, it's actually a funny practice that I used to do um, when I was in grad school. I would read the conclusions first to make sure that the major points that were actually in the course of the paper were useful for me to write my thesis. So I start with the meeting summaries first to go back and make sure, okay, so there was a point that I remember was a challenge that you know I didn't actually understand or didn't realize. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll also take a moment to read it one day, and then I'll also take a you know few days and then go back and see if I understand that point the same way. Did I actually feel that same way about a specific point or a specific you know approach that someone had? Um, because in the moment I might feel one way, and then you know when I look back at it the next day I might feel another way, and then you know now that I've had some time to think about it I might feel a completely different way than that. So these are kind of the ways I like to look at a more qualitative side. Um, obviously, it's a lot more inference, a lot more kind of gleaning of, you know, information and making sort of a, you know, somewhat determination of how you're going to look at that information and how you're going to act on it. And it's when you combine the quantitative items with the qualitative items that you get more of the best contextual picture of who you are as a person. Um, because you could obviously look at, oh, well, we hit our numbers every month, right? That hitting your numbers every month is great, but like there's also, you might have danger bubbling under the surface and it might be because you might have hit your numbers every month, but people feel unsafe telling you things. Mm. People feel they're uncomfortable <laughs> telling you when something bad is going to happen. And then now you're not hitting your numbers and you wonder why. Right. And that's why you don't want to look at things that are like the quote unquote lagging indicators, like hitting your numbers are kind of like, you know, obviously those are, uh, you know, positive things, but they're essentially kind of like a shadow of uh, something that might have occurred in the past. Right. Like a, like a deal you have, you know, that you're looking to close and, and things like that. You want to look for things that are very immediate that you can actually say, OK, this is a, a, a something that I can say is a leading indicator of danger, right? Like for example, not hitting your, if you're an early stage startup, a leading indicator of actually not hitting your numbers might be that you don't have product market fit, right? Uh, you know, or, you know, a leading indicator of, you know, some other form of danger could be, hey, I have people who are, you know, I have people who are really excited in the early days, you know, of the company. And then, you know, they kind of tailor off. That might be, um, you know, an indicator, of course, that you might have really bad training processes, or it might be that you have a bad culture, unfortunately. So you want to like look at all of those things. Um, you want to see if there's anything that you can actually use as kind of like a, a you know, a signal beacon to say, okay, this is an issue. And you want to use that as a better measure rather than things that are going to be you know, kind of like a lagging piece of data that won't tell you the complete picture until it happens. So it's kind of the approach I like to use. No, and I like that. And I'll give you the the quick anecdote, which is because I uh, one of the things that you hit on, at least and resonates with me, is the amount of data or even the amount of notifications. Because you get emails all day, you get texts, you get phone calls and everything else. And so I think, you know, even the, some of the tips you gave on simplifying it, if you're to go back and Side note, just as a fun anecdote. So there was, if you're to go back to when they were originally making the F6, I think it was the F16s. Like I'll, I'll, I'll call it the F16s, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, they had what they thought was going to be a really cool, uh, cool air feature on them, which they, what, which they called the Betty and Betty would basically come on and it would help the pilots. It would be basically be a little speaker in their head, you know, in their um, helmet that would tell them, Hey, you need to pull up. You need to go to the left. You need to go to the right. You need to go faster. You need to go slower. And, you know, it would give all these helpful things to make them improve and be better pilots. And yet <clears throat> the nickname that it eventually got, and I'm not going to say the actual word just because I try to keep this kids program programming but it'd be the b word the b word betty so and that in other words they called it the b betty um because it got to the point where it was, t it was talking in their ears so much that they ended up just turning it off every time because they couldn't concentrate it wasn't helpful didn't provide meaningful feedback because it was just too overwhelming and too much and so they ended up having to scale it back and just make it for the warning alerts like hey you're gonna crash 
you know, get out of the airplane or, hey, someone's shooting at you. You may want to, you know, respond aggressively, you know, those type of things. And then they found that it was, you know, it was worthwhile. And so I think, you know, kind of as you hit on the amount of notifications and how you get them, setting those up in the early days is as important because if you either don't get anything or you get overwhelmed, then you're not going to respond or it's not going to be helpful. So that that's my quick anecdote to bring it down <laughs> to my level of something that I could understand. Um <laughs> Well, but, um, you know, I, I was going to, you know, I was going to actually, um, you know, kind of uh, sort of look at it in a different lens, right? Like, I think we've talked about how folks have, uh, you know, how you can utilize data for your own internal use and like using other platforms. But I think there's also a good idea for folks who actually are people who have data integrated into their own products and services, right? Um, a bunch of startups probably do. A bunch of small businesses probably do. And I think that there's also the certain sense of what you said in terms of notification, right? You don't want things like, you know, basically ringing off the hook in terms of like, hey, hey, guess what? You got, you know, you have this happening. You have this happening. And it's like, okay, relax. Like now your tool is just overwhelming and then people churn out, right? Um, so I think that there's a certain set of, uh, I wouldn't say etiquette per se, but there's like a, a certain sort of good taste in terms of like, how much should you actually provide information to people that's going to be relevant? And I think if you're somebody building a, a product uh, or service around that, like for example, ourselves, right? Quick antidote. You know, when we looked at our own product, we looked at how can we measure, you know, how can we measure behavior of people, you know, going through the content that is on free fuse without um, necessarily being invasive, right? Like not having to have them fill out, you know, kind of forms or things like that. What is, what can we gather about behavior and what is actually actionable and relevant to the people who are actually using our product? And so, you know, when we kind of came with this framework of, oh, you can actually measure what um, segments people go down, you can measure what decision paths and, you know, kind of measure the percentages of each decision. It was like, okay, those are kind of like our high end. These are the things that we need to have data wise in order for people to just, you know, kind of easily understand it. Right. And so I think that as a, as a way for people to say, or, you know, kind of to gain some value from that, they really should look at, first of all, what is the high end value that someone is getting from using your product, your service, or whatever you're doing at your company. And then, you know, what you're going to want to do is obviously mold around the really good high level analytics. Don't notify people tons of times to make their lives just miserable and unaided with emails and things like that. And then once you do that, you'll find a very clear picture of what really is valuable. But the only way to really do that is obviously to test and see what things are most engaged with. And so that's kind of the framework that I would use for the folks who are actually building that into the product. No, and I think that's uh, definitely a, a great takeaway and a, a good uh, a good thought is to, you know, whether it's, I think it's everything from setup to notifications to ongoing information and data and kind of I, you know, it's, it's funny. It's, it, you know, I think a lot of times until you get into it, you think the more data, the more information, the more features I can provide is going to be better because it'll give them more tools. And yet it seems like always the opposite is true. The simpler you can make it, the easier the setup, the easier the data, the easier to interpret is always beneficial. It's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to make it, sim I think, simple, good, simple than it is uh, to, to make it complex. But I think that's uh, definitely a great uh, piece of advice. So well, we're already wrapping up towards the end of the episode, and there's many more things I'm sure we could talk about data, and we'll have to, to have you on or, or have a, a future conversation sometime. But uh, for this episode, as, as we're wrapping up, I always have one question I'd like to end at the end of, or ask at the end of each episode, so we'll jump to that now. So that question is, is within your industry, what is the biggest myth and why is it wrong? You know, I'm actually going to answer this in the case of specifically education. Right. And I think that I wanted to look at the idea of giving, I mean, with the scale of education, I think that we have a lot of folks who think it's really just an only one size fits all. And that's like the only way to do it. And I think for a long time that was true. But I think now with the case of, you know, adding in tools with artificial intelligence, adding in ways for us to gather data about, you know, where people are struggling, the data points that you can get from things like your learning management system, um, things about, you know, where people are having, you know, particular trouble points and like looking at things like, you know, sort of test scores and things like that. 
you can gather a really good picture of how to actually properly help somebody. And I think that there is a something to be said about giving people more of an active role in how they learn, you know, subject material in such a way where um, I would almost conjecture to say that you could actually personalize every learning experience. Um, I would like it for, I would like for the day to come where, you know, people could actually go and take a subject and actually learn the parts and pertinent elements of their subject rather than getting an outline from a bunch of people to tell them, hey, like you need to learn these particular major subjects in order for you to graduate. But literally to say, I want to actually learn these subjects so that I feel like they're going to contribute to what I'm going to be doing in the future. Because I'm not, I mean, I'm probably one of not, I'm probably not the only one, but there's probably tons of folks who've just taken classes and been disappointed that they didn't really actually utilize them in any way, shape or form for their future. And so I feel like by, you know, finding a way to personalize that experience in, uh, you know, everything from K through 12, all the way to higher education. And I think utilizing the tools that exist for us today, we'll be able to reach that time much quicker. Um, so I think that, before it might not have been a myth, but I think now more so than ever, the one size fits all education system is absolutely a myth. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great myth to dispel and uh, definitely makes uh, makes perfect sense. So, well, now as we wrap up the episode, um, if people want to reach out to you, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an employee, they want to be an investor, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you, find out more? Sure. Absolutely. So uh, you're free to reach out to me at mike at freefuse.com. Uh, you can also, of course, come to our site, freefuse.com as well. Um, you know, I'd, rec I'd recommend if you want to just play around with it, we actually have a uh, interface right on the front of the site you can play around with to test drive. Or you can just make a free account, um, you know, check it out and see what you can make. Super excited to see some exciting stuff you know, that people create. And, uh, you know, you can also find us on LinkedIn and uh, Instagram as well. So feel free to reach out in any of those places or connect with me at any time. I'm very responsive and would just love to hear from you. It's always good to have a good conversation. Awesome. We'll definitely encourage people to reach out, support a great uh, business, and if nothing else, make a new best friend. So with that, thank you again, Mike, for coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you that are listeners out there, if you can help us to share this expertise with even more startups and small businesses by clicking share, subscribe, and leaving us a review, helps us to reach all those businesses and make sure that they have or, that, or help them along their journey to success. And on that note, if you ever need help with your patents, your trademarks, or anything else with your startup, your small business, feel free to grab some time with us and just go to strategymeeting.com. Grab some time to chat. With that, thank you again, Mike, for coming on the podcast and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Awesome. Appreciate you, Devin. And uh, thank you again for having me on.